Now, eyewitness testimony is evidence supplied by people who will witness a specific event or a crime, relying only on their memory of what they saw. Now, statements will often have descriptions of the criminal or the crime scene, uh, the sequence of event, the time of day, or if there's anybody. However, people will always tend to interpret what they see very differently, and it's argued that what they recall is often influenced by what they expected to happen at the time. It's a standing joke between police officers that if you've got 20 witnesses to a crime, you'll actually have 20 different accounts of what happened. And because of this, police and psychologists have revealed that people's memories of crimes and accidents or incidents is often become inaccurate and therefore unreliable and can't be re Now, the Devlin report in 1973 very much supports this. Now, this and concluded that no jury should convict on eyewitness testimony alone because it is too unreliable. Now, that is all of the parts that should be going in your description. When we now, reconstructive memory is a theory of memory devised by Bartlett, which suggests that our memories are not reliable tape recorders where they replay the exact events. They are, in fact, affected by our schema, which is our pre-existing knowledge or expectation of what would happen in a certain situation. Now, because of these schemas and these expectations, they will confabulate or distort any memory that we have, where, for example, if we're missing a part of detail, you might fall back and rely on your schema to fill in the gap there. And that, therefore, makes... Now, a lot of the research for reconstructive memory comes from one of Bartlett's own studies on War of the Ghost, in which he gives participants a Native American story, um, which is particularly supposed to be against the cultural expectations or the cultural norms of the participants. And he asked them to recall the story on... Now, the Devlin report in 1973 very much supports this. Now, this report analysed 850... However, in contrast to this, it was argued that when the 20 accounts of um, Titanic survivors were investigated, they could all still recall the event accurately, despite when being shown the stereotypical scene of the ship pointing downwards and then sinking, did not influence their memories. Um, and they still recalled accurately, 15 out of the 20 witnesses did, that the Titanic broke apart. Now, if we move on to leading questions, leading questions suggest that it's the language that we're being that's being used when we're being questioned by police or in a courtroom that will edit or change our memory. And it's because of this information, which is given to us after the event, so the form of how a question is worded that will change the event. So an example of a leading question would be um, how old were the youths that you saw witnessing the crime? Because youths will obviously expect lead to this expectation that the people who committed the crime were younger and therefore this may change your memory. When we move on to looking at explaining the issue, you can obviously draw on any theories of memory, any studies that you've covered so far within the, the cognitive approach. I'm going to focus on three factors that you can use that will affect eyewitness testimony. These are reconstructive memory. Now, there's a separate video on this, which looks at this in a lot of detail if you need to revise that. Leading questions and weapon focus.
Now, Lottis did another study in 1979, which was outside the lab, and she staged a fake crime in a busy train station. Now, she used two of her female psychology students and asked them to leave a bag unattended on a bench. And while they were gone, a male student reached inside the bag, pretended to pull out an object, place it under his coat and walk away. Now, when the female students returned, they started shouting that their tape recorder had been stolen and asking eyewitnesses, did you see my tape recorder? Um, although there was no tape recorder at all, over half the witnesses remembered seeing a tape recorder. So again, showing that this idea of giving extra information after a crime can actually distort or change. There are also some real life examples of this, Yulon Cutshaw studied a local shooting and robbery in Vancouver and found that the accuracy of the recall did not decline after five months. Now, the shooting took place in view of several witnesses who were later tracked down by the researchers, and it was said that the level of accuracy in their memories or their eyewitness testimonies was very impressive compared with the original police reports, and that misleading questions had no effect on their accuracy of recall. So they argue that it is when an event is meaningful that it will have a better recollection rather than when it's an experimental video. And then eyewitness memory is good. So they're criticising Loftus by saying that you can't draw conclusions from her study because the emotions that were experienced in a normal or a, a real life crime However, it is important to note that not all attempts to mislead uh, witnesses will succeed. So Lotus fails to identify the type of suggestion which will increase or decrease the accuracy. So Cohen, for example, suggests that people are much more likely to be misled if the false information is insignificant, so if it's unimportant. Whereas if it's important information, sometimes witnesses will actually challenge the obvious discrepancy. So Loftus actually finds this as well in 1979, where participants were shown slides of a thief um, carrying a red purse. And later they were asked about the brown purse. And actually all but two of the participants actually said to the police and the experimenters, you know, that's wrong. It was it was a red purse. It wasn't a brown purse. So this shows that obvious details can't. Now, the third feature that we're going to look at is weapon focus. Now, weapon focus suggests that the presence of a weapon will alter our memory and that the weapon involved will allow us to... Now, Clifford and Scott demonstrated that people's recollection of non-violent events was superior to their memory of violent events. And they argue that this violence seems to interfere with the recall, focusing the participants' attention on one aspect of the situation, rather than allowing them to take a more general observation of what's going on. And this is where the idea of the weapon effect or weapon focus Loftus found evidence to support this from the University of Michigan, where participants were left outside a, a room in a lab. Uh, half the participants heard a quiet conversation about equipment failure, and they saw a man come out of the lab holding a pen. The other half of the participants heard quite a violent argument between two people, uh, followed by the sound of breaking glass, smashing chairs, and the man came out of this lab now, Loft has found that all of the participants, when given 50 photos and asked to choose the man that they'd seen, 49% of the participants who'd seen the pen were able to identify the correct man, whereas the participants who witnessed the man with the knife, only 33% were able, able to identify the correct man. And Loft has claimed that this is because they focused on the way Now, there are obviously method methodological problems with these research. A lot of Loftus' experiments were in labs and therefore have low ecological validity. And it's argued that watching videos causes little emotional involvement. Therefore, it doesn't replicate a real life setting where real life experience So although the research shows that there is a weapon effect, we're not sure why it occurs. So possible explanations that have been drawn by psychologists include that weapons are dramatic, so they draw attention away. They're threatening, so they therefore become a very central bit of information, a very important part of information, whereas the criminal's face may... Christy Anson stated that we distinguish central and peripheral details differently. So central information is very resilient, we're much more likely to remember it better, whereas peripheral information can often be distorted because it's seen as less important. If you were to conclude this with an essay, it's important to mention the introduction of cognitive interview techniques, which is what a lot of the Now, a cognitive interview technique could, inc could incorporate many of the different factors, so mentally reinstating the context of the crime, so asking the witnesses to remember what they smelt, what they were feeling, um, in order to be able to trigger the memories. They might ask witnesses to recall the event in different orders, or in a reverse order, or they might start halfway through the event and say what happened next. 
They may ask a witness to recall absolutely everything, regardless of what they might see as unimportant information. So, you know, what, what did you buy from the shop before you saw the crime happen or something like that in an attempt to try and allow their memory to become a linear sequence. Or they may be asked to recall the event from a variety of perspectives. So, for example, Now, it's important to understand the possible problems with eyewitness testimony and the consequences that they can lead, obviously, to a false conviction, and they're very serious. However, real-life witnesses cannot be ignored. We cannot have a criminal justice system where we can't recall on eyewitness testimonies, because this would make certain crimes, such as rape, completely untriable, because that may be the only type of evidence that you have available at the time. Don't forget, if you are asked a question above eight marks or more within the new specification, it is vital that you include a conclusion, because otherwise you will not be able to progress past a level. An example exam question is on the board now. Now, please don't forget this is from the old specification, but still the question could still be the same. So describe one key issue from the cognitive approach for four marks. And as mentioned at the beginning, this is the bit where you will outline what your key issue is and you will explain what eyewitness testimony is and why it may be unreliable. But you will not use any psychological research at this stage to back up why 